Welcome, folks. This morning, the message is going to be Upon This Rock, Part Dew. And Dew is simply fresh for two. This is a follow up of a message that I had preached in July the 12th of 2020. Uh, and in that first message, I talked about a dream that I had in September of 1986. That I was at Graceland Baptist Church outdoors in front of the prayer chapel. It was storming fierce with hail coming down all around and killing people around me. The storm did not feel like any storm that would even be possible on earth. It felt like a storm on another planet. I wondered what could possibly cause such a storm. I was instantly in the back parking lot between the church building and the school building. And in that moment, I met a man in this dream that I would later meet in real life. The real life person that I met was a man of God who ultimately fell short uh, between personality flaws that he had and some bad doctrine that he came across. Discernment to know what was going on, but not the wisdom to be able to constructively build his house upon the rock. In this dream, this man's legs are cut off, symbolizing his powerlessness. He referred to a demonic prince that he called the evil specter as the power behind the storm. When I heard this, I said, I must confront him. In the next instant, I was in the hallway, locker room area of the school building. I saw a hooded figure that looked like the Grim Reaper. And we enter into battle. The first thing that happens is that he pulls out this silver gun. I get scared, but I think I have to face the music. I can't back away now. It's too late to back off. He fires three fiery red bullets. They go into me, but no harm. In the next frame, he's got his hands around my throat. He's trying to choke me out, and I've got mine around his, and we're locked in battle to the death. And I don't know how long we was in this. It was a little bit in the dream. And then I hear a voice saying, Jesus is the cornerstone. Hit his head against the corner of the wall. What happened was that this locker room area had turned into a cave, but at one point in the cave, instead of it being just a jagged, rounded edge as you would see it, and it went into a cave, there was this corner that was as if it was fashioned, but not by human hands. So I killed this powerful demon by hitting his head against the corner of the wall multiple times, until on the final blow, his skull is crushed, and my right hand hits the corner of the wall. I killed this powerful demon, using Christ as the cornerstone, as my weapon. In the years to come, I would have a deep consciousness that Christ must be the rock. But I struggle with the how. The answer to this question is much trickier than some naive analyses would suggest. There are two classes of answers that are wanting. One could be generally classified as Armenian or Armenian leaning. Here there's an emphasis on man's responsibility. And it's not without merit, there is a responsibility to repent. But an overemphasis here risks shifting the foundation from Christ to men. I remember when I was a young Christian, and I went to Grayson Baptist Church, but I saw this in common with a lot of churches at that time. They would preach the perfect sermon, awesome sermon, anointing. Then they would have an altar call. The altar call was good. And then they would come and they would tell people to come down to the altar and make Jesus Lord and Savior. Something occurred to me over the years that just bugged me about that. If I can make Jesus Lord, then can I unmake him Lord? If 
I'm just giving them the wheel momentarily and say, I'm putting you in charge and I pull you back. You see, if I make Jesus Lord, then I'm really in charge. And if I'm in charge, my house is not built upon the rock. And Peter in Acts addresses this. In the very first sermon, Peter boldly proclaims, God has made Jesus both Lord and Christ. See, I don't make Jesus Lord. God made Jesus Lord. God put him on the throne. And he, his own life is built upon the rock of the deity, the rock of the I am. In humanity, he depended totally on the Father, and in deity, he had the full rights of deity. And he had both of these natures uh, connected in one person. They, they were not intermingled, but they were not separated, that they were tethered together in the person of Jesus Christ. I preached a sermon called the reign of the God man where I go into more detail about how that works. The Calvinists would agree that God has made Jesus both Lord and Christ. As Calvinism and philosophies and theologies that lean that way emphasize the sovereignty of God to the exclusion of human agency and free agency. This solves the problem of how Christ is the foundation but tell us little about how God actually moves in the world. While God certainly can move independently of human action and intentionality, his normal activity in the world is mediated through both human actions and the use of free will to make decisions relevant to salvation and sanctification. As Paul wrote to the Philippians, God works in us so that we both will and do his good pleasure. With this in mind, it should be noted that Christ could have stepped into the dream and killed the demon for me. He instead provided me with everything I needed for victory and spoke his word to me to instruct me on how to get this victory. And our primary text to show this, how this works in the real world, we can be built upon a rock is found in Luke the 6th chapter verses 46 to 49 and here's how it reads and why call ye Lord Lord and do not the things which I say whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them I will show you to whom he is like he is like the man which built a house and digged deep and laid the foundation on a rock and when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like the man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Jesus tells us three things here. But before I get into that, I just want to comment about the house that was not built on the rock. You see, folks, that house was built largely the same way. And what is that house? It's a superstructure. It's our words. It's our deeds. It's the things we do. And the building materials are largely the same on both houses. And on the sunny day, they both do fine. But when the storm hits, that reveals the house that endures. The house that was just laid on the earth crumbled when the storm hit. But it's the one built upon that rock that stands. And Jesus tells us three things here that we need to do. To ensure that we are building our lives upon the rock. One is to draw near to God. Whosoever cometh to me. Was the words Jesus said there. And the next thing. Is hearing. Studying God's word. 
Jesus calls it hearing my saying. And then the last part is doing God's word. Or as Jesus would say in the King James here, translating the King James, and doeth them. We are to draw near to God. That's the very first thing to do. We draw near to his presence through praise and worship. Psalms 104, we're to enter his gates with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise. And in Psalms 22, 3, but thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. David composed many psalms to reflect his constant episodes of drawing near to God. David practiced this in his life. Many of these psalms were composed in the warp and woof of everyday life and things happened. And there were good things in David's life. He lived the glorious life, but then he had some very bad episodes. Episodes bringing the point of despair. And in 1 Samuel 30, we see in that chapter one such episode. And it came to pass when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south in Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire. And had taken the women captives that were therein, that had slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to this city, and behold, it was burned with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. That sounds bad, folks. I would be very sad if I came home, my house was burned to the ground. My wife and my sons were gone, and I knew had no idea where they went. And David and his people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captive, Ahinoam the Jezreelites, and Abigail the wife of Nabal the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed. Folks, that's an understatement. For the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. They despaired to the point of suicide, to the point of murder. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. David drew near to God. It's believed he was highly skilled in musical instruments, and we, we see psalms about the playing of the instrument, and we know from the text of Scripture that David played a musical instrument, the Cobb Saul. So he may have gotten on one, or he may have sung a cappella. I picture him playing his musical instrument, worshiping the Lord, drawing near to God, because he knew God had the answers. So David entered into a time of worship, to come into the presence of God. Because he knew that the answers required him to draw near to God. Because he knew he didn't have the answers, but he knew the Lord did. He knew he needed to draw near to God to obtain revelation. And that involves hearing, that involves studying God's word. What does that mean for us today? Well, there's three things that we should be doing to gain revelation from God. We should be studying the scriptures. We should be asking God for wisdom. And then we should be asking God for special revelation. What do these three things involve? Let us find out. We see here that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That's in 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. The Bible is given 
that we can have the big picture of what God's doing. And it's in several categories. For doctrine, we need to know the right doctrine of Jesus Christ. Some people talk about how uh, they're not concerned about the Bible, that they would rather think about Jesus Christ. But how do we know what Christ is like? We have testimony of what Jesus Christ is like right here. In here, in the Word, is uh, the instructions that allow us to know what needs to be reproved, what needs to be corrected, what's good, what's bad. It is in the Bible we get our instruction of righteousness. That we may be perfect. Instructed in all good works. Now notice here in the previous text, before I go into the text on wisdom, it says that the man of God is to be complete. The scripture is all sufficient, is what that means. And that's what uh, Paul was saying when he penned that in Timothy, is that the Bible is totally sufficient to equip us for all good works. But this raises a question. If I'm a doctor, and I want to be a doctor, do I open up uh, chapter and verse to medical school, 10th chapter, the first verse? The good doctor, the 23rd chapter, the fifth verse. Do we do that? No, we don't do that. Even believers, strong believers who want to be a doctor, they'll go to medical school. And they learn from books in medical school. So. In what sense, then, does the Bible make us complete? It does so in providing the world view, the meta-narrative under which everything fits. And there are really only a few meta-narratives in the world. There's one meta-narrative that says time plus chance plus immaterial matter produces everything. This is the worldview of secular humanism, and it's found wanting. It cannot explain why man is who, who he is, why man is what he is. Just not able to. Then you have another worldview that believes that God evolved out of the primordial goop and uh, is a cosmic principle within the natural realm that manifests himself, herself, itself through different phenomena in nature. That stand out. This is the worldview of paganism. It stands wanting. Then there is the worldview or meta and the ethic of biblical Christianity. A self existent God. He didn't evolve, evolve out of the goop. It's not time plus matter plus chance, but that there is an infinite personal God who created the heavens and the earth. He spoke the earth into existence. In his eternal decree, he set up space-time history. And he created man in his image and placed us in this story and gave us free will that when we come to him of our own volition. And he didn't leave us there. He entered into this story. He spoke at numerous and sundry times to the prophets. And he appeared personally in history, in space-time history, in the man, God-man, Jesus Christ. So the Bible gives us this meta-narrative. But what happens if you know? You know you're called to go to medical school. You're not going to get trained by directly reading the Bible. The Bible will give you the meta-ethics, the meta-narrative, the ethical principles. We can learn from the Bible about the sanctity of human life. And the Hippocratic Oath was influenced much by that. It was the idea with the idea of doing no harm, even though Hippocrates was himself not a Christian. Uh, even as late as the days of the Jews in the Old Testament, as the Jewish people came in contact with the pagan nations, uh, there were some who saw the goodness of God, saw the wonder of his statutes, 
And even if they didn't give credit to the God of heaven, God was at work in history. God is wonderfully at work in history. But how, just how now, Once you have that call and you know you've been called to go to medical school, how do you determine what you should do? Are we left just to our own wits? Are we building one part of the foundation on the rock and the other just on whatever we can figure out? I would say not. We have been given the call to ask God for wisdom. James 1, 5 to 8, it says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. And let not that man think he will receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. That's James 1, 5 to 8. God for wisdom, you know, while you're asking God for wisdom, you're looking up stuff, and you kind of whittle down your list of medical schools to three medical schools. There's one in upstate New York that sticks out to you, a uh, stellar reputation. Then there's a medical school in Chicago, and the University of Louisville. Now, for those who like to fact check everything, the first two, uh, I am using hypothetically. I, I'm not going to say that those are the top two, that the one in New York is top two, and I've not even named it because it's it's an illustration here. So now that we've got that out of the way, you've got one in Upper State, New York, Chicago, Illinois, and then the U of L in Louisville, Kentucky. And you're you live a few miles out of Louisville. You're still at home with your family. Your mother's uh, getting up there in years a little bit. Uh, and you're weighing, what should I do? And that school in New York really rocks. But then on your feed, you find some disturbing news about it. Of, of a professor who was fired. Because of a TV appearance when he made where he was skeptical of some of the CDC talking points on COVID. And it was a big story because this guy is considered world renowned in his field. The best of the best. He gets fired. He gets canned. And they cite he's canned because he's putting out disinformation that stands in contradiction to the CDC guidelines and the guidelines of the health authorities. And so then you wonder, and then you hear uh, some other stuff that's happened where it's a real hostile environment to Christians, real tough for Christians to, and so you're asking God for wisdom and God gives you some wisdom here and you realize that that's probably not where you need to go if you're wanting to be a doctor, and especially if you view the practice of medicine as a ministerial thing. So you cross out through the wisdom of God, and you eliminate the medical school in New York, and you're thinking about the University of Chicago and the University of Louisville, and Chicago's really looking good. It's much better reputation. It's still considered one of the top medical schools, but you're still, you haven't crossed that little because it's real close to home and you could still spend every day with your mother and your, your family. So you've gained wisdom from God, but you're not quite ready to decide. It's not quite enough here.
But before we go deeper into what the revelation of God is, I, I just want to reiterate here, folks, that asking God for wisdom is not a mechanical thing, but that Jesus Christ himself is a personification of wisdom. In Proverbs 8, we see uh, some extended text between verses 22 and 30. In the proverb, we see female imagery, but the description matches perfectly with the description of Jesus Christ as the living word of God. And here's how the text reads. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way. Before his works of old, I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, wherever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there was no fountain to bound me with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the earth, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave the sea his decree that the water should not pass his commandments, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. Proverbs eight twenty two to 30. That's the personification of Jesus Christ. And he is full of all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He inspired the holy book of the Bible to give us a worldview. And he gives us words of wisdom to help us to analyze the things of life as they come our way. But sometimes we need that special word. A word not discernible through our analyses coming directly from God. We need what the, the Bible calls in the New Testament the word of knowledge. We need to ask God for special revelation. And here we revisit Samuel 30 again, 1 Samuel 30. And remember earlier in the chapter, David was devastated because his wives were, were kidnapped the city that he was in was destroyed, and he and his men were at the point of despair, to the point that the men wanted to stone him, but David found strength in the Lord. He came into the presence of God, and he knew it was the it, 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 right time for revelation. He knew he was in a place where there was power for revelation, power for miracles. So back then, he did what any good Old Testament saint had a priest that could inquire for the Lord. So it, it is here where we read in 7 verses 7 and 8 that David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech son, I pray thee, bring thee hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought hither the ephod to David. Now ephod was simply a part of the priestly garment that they would typically wear when they would go in to inquire of the Lord. David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this truth? Shall I overtake them? And he answered, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. David got revelation from God, folks. And God told him to go. And David went. And he surely recovered. And he overthrew these Amalekite raiders and destroyed them. David's not the only one who asked God for special revelation here. Jesus Christ asked God for special revelation. And we see an interesting text in the Gospel of John, the fifth chapter, verses 19 to 23. Then answered Jesus and said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For whatsoever things he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. 
and he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. For as the Father raises up the dead, and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judges no man, but hath committed all judgment to the Son. That all men should honor the Son, even they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Notice Jesus says that he does nothing of himself, but he watches the Father. Jesus looked to God for revelation, and whatever he saw the Father doing, that's what he did. Now, if super genius Jesus needs revelation, why don't you? If super genius Jesus needs revelation, why don't me? Why don't I? And here's an interesting text in Luke. To the second chapter, 46 to 47. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. Jesus had walked into a meeting of the peers. It would be like the day somebody goes to U of L or any university. A better example would probably be Harvard. You know, this was the Harvard of Israel. The brightest minds, the most learned theological men in Israel were having a conversation. They were talking shot talk. Jesus stumbles in the midst of this conversation. Starts asking them questions, and giving them answers. And these doctors were astonished at his understanding and answers. There's two ways that this could be understood. One, they were shocked that this 12 year old had adult level understanding. Another way to interpret it is that they were shocked that he was able to talk to them as a peer. That Jesus had understandings of these matters that were on the same level as these highly learned men. I opt for the latter. I believe Jesus had the equivalent of a PhD in these matters at 12. Now, in... And I'm going to suggest here that we can use this to estimate what Jesus' IQ is. Now, by estimating his IQ, I'm not saying that if we take our standard IQ test, time travel in the past, that he would score high. That wouldn't happen because our current IQ tests are key to this culture. And Jesus, as a man, would not have been key to this culture. He would have been raised up in the culture of first century Judea. And I'm not talking about the IQ of the divine nature. The divine nature of Jesus was all known. There's no way to measure that IQ. By Jesus' IQ, I am talking about the IQ in his humanity. I'm talking about the potential of his brain to process information. And one way that they would do that with children is something called mental age. If you would calculate the mental age, at what age of mental development is someone in terms of their knowledge? And then you divide that by their chronological age. If you, if you go by adult uh, understanding, it's 18 divided by 12 and an IQ of 150. Or if you're going to do age 30, which was about the age at which these men became doctors, became part of the Sanhedrin, became recognized and registered as the learned man, you do 30 divided by 12, that's 250. Now, to make this a little, give another layer of nuance to this, you would factor that the average IQ of these men would have been higher than the average overall. And the average for the global population is about 100. So 
if the average IQ of a college professor is 130, you could multiply that by 1.3. You get close to the 300. So Jesus' IQ is between 150 to 200 or even higher. Any IQ above 200 is considered an outlier. And that's where you take the number of people that's lived and you just map that to the normal distribution. Uh, anything above 200 is off the normal distribution. Jesus was as smart as they came. And he had something that most super geniuses don't have. He had special acumen to be able to communicate to the guy on the street. Most people who are super intelligent uh, struggle to communicate uh, the bigger the difference in IQ. And in fact, uh, scholars believe today that it's uh, extremely difficult to impossible for someone to consistently communicate with someone whose IQ is two standard deviations lower than their own. But Jesus did this with great facility. He communicated to the, the man in the street. He communicated with fishermen, with farmers, with beggars. He was at home with them. Even though he had an IQ, he could have entered the academy, any academy. He could have went to Rome and impressed their scholars just as easily as Jerusalem. This kind of intelligence, he says, without the Father, I can do nothing. When are we going to have that attitude towards God where we look to God? It's been fair to how through our wits we can build our platform, promote our name. If we look to Jesus. You know, when we look to Jesus, draw near to God, then look to Jesus to see what he has to say. Then it's time for a decision. Back to our analogy of the medical school, you realize you're at an impasse, even with the wisdom God's given you, so you just ask God to tell you, and you're seeking God, and you have a dream one night. And in that dream, God says, I want you to go to University of Louisville. He says, son, I understand that you... Uh, think Chicago is a better medical school, and they are second to none, but I want you to go to Louisville. So you say, okay, Lord, I will obey you. I'll go to the one in Louisville. And you enroll and matriculate in the University of Louisville. You've gone into medical school two years. You're nearing, you're about ready for your internship. A rigorous schedule. Suddenly, you get a call. Your mom is being very sick, needs to go to the hospital. She's in the hospital almost 90 days. The doctors don't give her uh, much hope to live. She got sick with COVID. You had your 14-day uh, quarantine period, and then you were, you were back. She went into the hospital and almost died. And lived only through the prayers of the saints. She received her miraculous healing as they declared by the stripes of Jesus she is healed. And she spared death. But there's still a road to recovery. God saved her from death, but there's still issues. Uh, she's needing rehabilitation, physical therapy. At home, she needs help with the family. This requires a good deal of your time to deal with it. And then you're thinking, Lord, I thank you that you told me that. I would have had to have dropped out of medical school if I would have been in Chicago. If I would have been in Chicago, I don't know if she would have survived. How did God know that? We, he knows it because he's God. He saw this coming. 
and you saw something coming that you could not have seen in your analysis. You could not have seen through wisdom. And it wasn't necessarily something that was written verbatim in Scripture. Yes, there are a lot of prophecies in Scripture. Jesus fulfilled 300. We have extensive information about the end times. In numerous cases where we can look at the prophecy, then later on see that it was fulfilled in history. But yet the Bible is a mighty prophetic book. But it doesn't necessarily have prophecies of the life of each individual. It would be impossible to write a book with detailed knowledge of the billion plus people who have come to know the Lord or of the 108 billion people that have lived on this earth. Sometimes putting the word into practice requires that we receive revelation. And then once we receive that revelation, we act in obedience to what he has revealed to us. And here's the thing. And here's, in order to do this, folks, this requires repentance. Because None of this does any good if this revelation leads to a command and you don't do it. The moment that you fail to obey God's commands, you have pulled your house out from the foundation. So it means obedience to commands, using the means that he's given you. That's what we can do, what, what God puts on us to do. And God could have done it all for us, but that's not how he chose to operate in history. He chose to use means. He chose to use means that freely exercised their will. And he foresaw everything that was going to happen. He, he foresaw everything that could happen and gave his eternal decree in a manner that the story is exactly the story he wanted. And yet in that story, we make free choices. And we have responsibilities in that story. So it means obedience to his command, and it also means confessing God's word always. Especially concerning the impossible. And here we read James 14 to 17 and then in verse 26. What doth it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he hath faith and hath not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister being naked or destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, Notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Pastor Chris had talked a few weeks back about this. And in fact, it was the last sermon that he had presented here, folks. Uh, that same faith is no alone. And I struggled with this myself as a young Christian. And verse 26 gave me the insight. It says, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So that helped me to have an analogy here. Uh, if you uh, have the analogy of faith as a body, and the works as a seed inside the body. So you see, folks, saving faith God has implanted through his word, the seed of the works that we are to do. And so... Sometimes that word is expressed by us doing things. Sometimes when though when people are in need of food or clothes, the answer of God to their prayers is you. The answer involves you doing something. And if you don't, when you're instructed to, then at that point you've denied the faith. Am I saying that they're not Christian? No, but I'm saying that they have at that point denied the faith. They have cut the faith off. And those who do that as a matter of course, as a matter of lifestyle, uh, may very well be that they're not saved. So if you're finding that your, your works don't align up with your faith, that you have a lifestyle that stands diametrically opposed to what you say you believe, Maybe check to see that you're in the faith. Because the just shall live by faith. And it's the faith that's 
the basis of what they do. It's the beliefs that undergird what they do that God's going to look at, not necessarily what people profess in their creed. The other half of doing the Word of God means proclaiming the Word of God. And we talked previously about proclaiming by what we do. But we proclaim the Word of God by confessing that Word. And the power of confession here is relevant when we are faced with the impossible. And we need that miracle. There is a circle of faith here, and we the circle is set up in Romans 10, 6 to 17, and Luke 6 to 45. We confess the word of God, and the proclaim of that word produces hearing. It transforms our senses, which produces faith. And overflowing out of faith is confessing God's word, and then it goes into a circle. As we saw in that little graphic there, Romans 10, 17 exposes the first two legs of this cycle. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If we change this passive wording to act, we get the proclaimed word of God yields transformed senses, which yields faith. The word of God is proclaimed in human senses, transforming them. Those transformed senses allow the observer to see through the lens of faith, producing faith. I believe that something quantum mechanical happens here. And in quantum mechanics uh, tells us that when we conduct a measurement on something or we observe something, that the wave function collapses and then we see the object in the physical world with the properties it has and, and the methods and ways that it has. And with faith, faith allows us to tinker with that. Faith allows us to access the things of God that alter how this universe works. And through faith, we can achieve the impossible. But you see, folks, the circle of faith is a cycle of faith. Confession that releases supernatural power. It begins... When the word of God is proclaimed, the human sense is transforming them. The transformed senses allow the observer to see through the lens of faith, producing faith. This faith overflows into confession, proclaiming God's word to human senses. The cyclical iteration results in ever-increasing faith until supernatural power is released into the realm of our experience. That's how Sister Anne got healed. We kept proclaiming, by the stripes of Jesus, she is healed. Father, we ask you to just manifest on earth what is already ordained in heaven. And I preached a sermon called The Stripes of Jesus, which focused on faith, on faith for healing. But we can proclaim any of the promises of God this way. We've been given promises. According to his divine power, has given us to all things that pertain unto life and godliness. To the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto a succeeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. That's in 2 Peter 1, 3-4. We have been given great, great promises, folks. And the promises in the New Testament are greater than the Old Testament. So to summarize what I've just talked about here, uh, when we build our house on the rock, we need to draw near to God in worship. We need to get revelation from God, which begins with studying the scriptures. We go from there to asking God for wisdom, and then from there to asking him for the special word of knowledge. And then we're to do God's word. And that means... That using our resources to obey his commandments in those areas where we're able to do something 
and proclaiming the words of God always and especially on those things that are impossible that represent things we can't do and need him to do. We can proclaim the promises of God and then we humbly ask Father. We ask you just to manifest on the earth what has already been ordained in heaven. And the reason why you do the two-pronged approach is that we don't want to get arrogant and think that it's just us running our mouth and that we can, you know, do positive confession. And because we've got this positive confession, everything's going good. And we just avoid those negative confessions because things go bad. It's not about positive and negative confession. And there's a teaching on that that's borderline occult. I'm not referring to that occultic NAR teaching that's new age, new agey in its orientation. I am talking about proclaiming the word of God. Standing on the rock of God's word, standing on the rock of Jesus. And when we know that we have a biblical promise, standing on the promise that is written. As we do that, watch God to do the impossible. If we do this, folks, we will be built upon the rock. And folks, we have to repent. All of us do. We don't pray enough. We don't seek God enough. We tend to pray only when there's an emergency and then we quit when the emergency is over with. Sister Ann had a setback. It's not a big setback, but it could have been life-threatening. She's currently in the hospital. At one point, they thought she had sepsis. Now they're saying that they stopped it before it became sepsis. I believe God reversed it. Many people resume prayer. And at one point, back in November and December, lots of people was praying fervently. As Ann got better, many of us slacked off. We need to repent. This was a wake-up call. And we need and we we don't need to stop as soon as we get the big answer. We need to continue for the next answer and the next answer until the final great awakening happens till Jesus Christ returns. So folks, build your life upon the rock through seeking his presence, studying his word, and doing his word. That's all I have for today. You have a wonderful